Good morning, Sheila. Good morning, Harvey. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. Just, just give us a brief introduction of who you are, what you're doing, where you are, things of that sort. Okay. So I am originally from Ghana, but I also grew up in the Gambia. And um, I came to study in Scotland about 10 years ago. Now I'm married to a Sierra Union and my children are Scottish. So I've crossed a lot of cultures in my, in my short life so far. <laughs> so I came to Scotland about yes, 11 years ago to study media. Because when I was in the Gambia, I was working as a sub-editor for a national newspaper. And I wanted to continue my learning in that area. So I came here to study media. And afterwards, I sought some work experience. And then I decided to pursue more academic interests. And I went back to university to do a master's in international development. And when I finished that, I saw um, an opportunity for, for this PhD. And I decided to, to apply for, for it purely out of personal interest because it wasn't really in my, my line of, of field. So I applied for it and here I am today. What was the master's in? In international development. International development. Yes. So then I was very interested, still in religion. I was more interested about the relationship between religion and development, okay. and especially abroad. Yes. So I've had um, a keen interest in religious matters for yeah, a very long time. Mm. And this PhD actually brought everything together. Okay. And so say, say a bit about the, the PhD. Okay, so my PhD um, studied new churches in Glasgow. And it initially started because the, my supervisor, who is um, Reverend Dr. Kenneth Jeffrey of the University of Aberdeen, he wanted to study church growth in general in Scotland. Because for a long time, the, the story of the church or even of religion in general, especially in Scotland, has been that of decline very consistent and persistent decline and nothing at all no attention at all had been paid to even the possibility of any growth or anything happening under the surface so he wanted to throw some light in that area to find out if anything at all was happening especially within the traditional denominations if anything had changed or it was still the story of decline so he advertised the topic and I, I was personally interested in it because from my own experience as a Christian in, in Glasgow and in Scotland for, for some years, I didn't believe that it was all bad news because in my um, specific community, I could see a lot of you know, vibrancy, a lot of activity, a lot of you know, churches around. And I didn't believe that it was all decline, decline, decline as the 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 news always was so when i saw the topic it was something of personal interest to me because i really wanted to to find out so i applied for it and then he agreed are you able to remember the topic itself the way it was advertised okay so the original topic was church growth in a post-christendom age of decline okay. in scotland okay so that was the original topic but when we started um to broach the subject, we decided to streamline it. And we found out that we could actually focus exclusively on new church activity because a lot had been done already in the past on what was going on in the traditional churches. And nothing had been really done in um, the area of new churches or new church planting or any new growth. So we decided to focus in that area and thank God we did because we found out that a lot was happening there that was not known at all to, to anybody. What did you find <laughs> that was not known at okay. all? <laughs> yes, so my research period, I decided to study um, new church activity in Glasgow, which sure. is where I live and the, the ground I knew better. So new church activity in Glasgow from the year 2000 to the year 2016. Okay. And I found out that actually in that period, in the 16 year period, 110 new churches had been started 
in the city of Glasgow, which is just a small council area in, in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So 110 new churches had been started and only 6% of these churches were actually started by the traditional denominations. So 94% of all these new churches were actually independent or new foreign denominations that had come into the, into the country. So this really was very significant because it showed that by the Christian landscape of the city and of even Scotland itself had really changed dramatically. Yes, and a lot was going on. Then apart from the, the volume of the number of churches, new churches found, I also found that the churches were actually being or developing along very distinct ethnic lines. So new churches in Scotland or in Glasgow are either exclusively African, Asian, or High Scottish. And it is very hard to find one that was like very well mixed. So new churches are appearing in Glasgow at the rate of about seven a year. The majority are ethnic minority. And within the ethnic minority group, 79% are African churches. 79. So it's a very, yes, very interesting mix <laughs> wow. of, you know, what is happening here, here in terms of new church activity in Glasgow. Three key things there, right? The first is that yeah. actually the story of decline doesn't really tell the whole story. Yes. There is growth somewhere. Somewhere, right? yeah. But most of this That's growth... not receiving any focus. Because it's it's mostly in minority churches. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yes. then even among the minorities, the the minorities themselves are not mixing among among themselves as minority churches. Yes, so the minority churches have their own different categories. There are African churches, there are Asian churches, and then there are other white ethnic churches like Romanian churches and Russian okay. congregations and that forth, yes. And then within the African church group, there are also different categories. All right. So you have your Ghanaian churches and your Nigerian churches. So they're all organized along like specific national lines. So it's just a lot of divisions, not in a, a negative way, but sure. yeah, that's what is happening. Yeah, churches are appearing in categorized forms yeah okay. in, in glasgow and scotland all right um this has been going on for some time but it's going yes. on under the radar what under the, yeah yeah why why would you think that that would be the case that people would continue talking about church decline when there's mm -hmm. actually church growth somewhere in in their own communities but they don't see it Yes, it's just, um, I think the first problem is that of research or the, the researching community. Because in the, traditionally, the focus has always been on the, what is happening in the traditional and established churches. Which is, is their story that has, like the Church of Scotland, the Methodist Church, the sure. Episcopal Church, and yes, those established churches in Scotland. And, and that was your stories, original topic, right? Yeah, so initially I wanted to study growth in these traditional churches. Okay. Yeah, any inklings of growth until we decided to actually, you know, look <laughs> another way because yeah, a lot has been done there already. So we decided to look somewhere that nothing has been done. And, and so good this enough, is the problem. You looked where the yes. growth is actually happening. Yes, and then we found out the growth was actually happening outside the, the traditional denominations. Yes, so it has to do with um, local research. Okay. So large-scale national research doesn't always tell the, the real story. Sure. But every time when you go down to, to the grassroots, you can, you can find something different. And that is what happened with, with this research. We decided to make it very localized, look at a small area in Scotland, like the city of Glasgow, go on the ground and I actually found sometimes on foot <laughs> when it's about looking for, for these churches myself. Yeah, how yes, did you find them? How I, yeah, so <laughs> it was a very interesting 
yeah methodology that okay. i used so um but the most important um thing that helped me or resource was that of the the um the charity register it's called oscar mm -hmm. so because most charities well all charities are supposed or required to register with oscar if they want to receive certain benefits and churches are charities a lot of the new churches register with with oscar okay so i decided to go and do um come through the the oscar register all right then i saw some strange names <laughs> that i supposed though i thought might be churches and i had a list of them and i investigated further so that was the first point of the the most important resource that i used and then because i also come from a specific um, christian community the african pentecostal christian community in glasgow yes. i knew a lot of the, the churches around and what was going on i knew where they advertised their programs like if you went to um, an African shop, you would see posters of okay. you know different churches advertising programs. So I went to all these shops as well to to look at what was available. Yes, and then on a Sunday morning, I would go out and at bus stops you see people dress nicely, and I'll just ask, "Oh, are you going to church or something?" And then they'll say yes, and I'll ask, "What's your church's name?" And then I'll I'll get some details. So those were the yeah the very how do i call it <laughs> untraditional yeah. yeah yeah means that i used to to locate these new churches and, and that's the good thing about grassroots research right yes that, that you, yes. you get to places where some people wouldn't go to would never have looked yes mm -hmm. and, and, what's and that's that? exactly the story of the of the new churches because they're very hard to find because okay. they're very mobile as well. So a new church in its lifetime can worship in about five different places mm -hmm. because of the inavailability of worship space. They struggle to find places of worship. So they move from community place, to community uh, and venue to venue. So you really need to pay close attention before you can actually find them, you know, and you even verify their, their status. So yes. you said you said um, how many churches have been started between 2000 and 2016? So 110 new churches 110 have new been churches. started, yes, in the Glasgow City Council area alone. Okay. Yes. And, and how many and of now, these were African? So out of the 110, 51% okay. in total are African churches. Okay. Thirty-five percent are Scottish, five Scottish churches. Okay. And nine percent are Asian churches. Africans yeah, so African are... churches are the yes, the largest number of new churches in Glasgow are African churches. What denominations? So and um, very few actually are okay. connected to some of the traditional or known African denominations like the Church of Pentecost or the Redeemed Christian Church. And the majority are actually started by individuals, so they are independent. Uh, entirely independent. Yes. Yes. So in terms of the known African denominations, um, the Redeemed Christian Church of God, they have the most churches. They have 13 branches. In Glasgow? In the city of Glasgow alone, yes. 13? Yeah, 13, yes, in Glasgow wow. alone. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the Church of um, Pentecost has three okay. in Glasgow. They have others outside outside Glasgow, mm -hmm. but three in the city of Glasgow, three assemblies. Okay. Yeah. And then the Mountain of Fire Ministries, they also have about three branches in Glasgow. Yeah, and a few other known um, African denominations. But the majority of the African churches started in Glasgow are independent. Yes, that's wow. by individual. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's exciting. I mean, um, in in this general conversation of uh, African Christians mm -hmm. participating in, in mission in the diaspora, yes, it's 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 becoming more and more clear that where where Christianity is growing, where churches are growing, not just in Scotland, 
mm-hmm. but all across all mm-hmm. across Britain and probably even all across Europe. It's yeah. mostly African churches that, that are growing. Yes, yes, yes. And that was one of the, if you like, the um, hypothesis that I wanted to, to, to find out or to prove. Sure. Because I was aware there was a lot of African church growth happening in England and outside Scotland. But okay. nothing had been done in Scotland and, you know, it, we, it wasn't known at all if the same thing was, was happening here or could be happening here. So one of the, the aims of my research was to find out if what was happening in the, in the southern hemisphere of the country was <laughs> you know, replicating up here. And it is. So okay. the, the story is it's, it's very consistent here yeah, of you know, African church growth all over, all over Britain. So what, 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 what's the mission or impact of these African churches in Scotland? Did, did you find anything suggesting that they are being effective missionaries in, 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 in Glasgow? Yes, well, in several ways. Sure. So one of the, the ways I'll say is that they have, they've made Christianity very visible in the okay. public space. Oh, really? And it's a term, I call it um, sacralizing, resacralizing sacred places. Okay. Okay. So, for instance, a lot of the African churches are buying um, old Church of Scotland buildings that are going out of use because of dwindling congregation sizes in, in that dom- denomination. So, in the past, these um, buildings would have been maybe sold on to developers or for you know, other secular uses. But these new African churches are actually raising funds to buy some of these buildings to use for, for, for themselves. So they are resacralizing those sacred sure. places. Sure. And they're also resacralizing like public spaces because I was so surprised, you know, when I went about to find out where the African churches are actually worshiping or where they, they can be found. Okay. So you can find them everywhere in industrial areas, Okay. On the high street, in hotels, you know, so places that you would normally not think or not supposed to find um, a worshipping community, mm-hmm. you, can, you can find them there. So in that way, they are making Christianity or the Christian faith very visible to, to, to people sure. in, in these public spaces. Yes. And then, but one of the places I think they have not really had the impact that they would have wanted or they would want to make is in actually attracting the indigenous people or indigenous Scottish people to their churches. Because when I started speaking to the leaders of the, all these African churches, every one of them has a big vision. And the vision is to reach Scotland. So they want to attract everybody, the whole Scotland. So in fact, almost every African church has international in its name. <laughs> because their big vision and their aim is to be international and attract everyone. But yeah. so far, they have had very little, um, if you like, missionary success in, in that area. And they tend to attract only people, you know, who um, subscribe to their culture or people, people like themselves. So that is an area I think they have not been successful in, although they, they hope to, to, to make that impact here. Yeah. Did, did you hear of any reasons for that? Are the pastors aware of that this is an issue? Yeah, so for the majority of them, they actually don't, they think they are doing a lot of work. Okay. <laughs> they think they are working hard enough to attract um, um, the indigenous population because they have the goal for evangelism. Like if you go to Glasgow City Center on a, on a Saturday, you'd, you're likely to find somebody starting, standing there was a, a speaker preaching or a church congregation doing some singing or something. So they do a lot of public outreach. Sure. Yes. They also do a lot of social outreach because a lot of them have like food banks. My church does, um, we, we do an annual food bank, a donation to a food bank on, on Mother's Day. Oh. So there's a lot of social yeah, participation in the social sphere as well. Yeah. But yeah, in spite of all these, um, activities or these outreaches, the, the, the result 
that they desire to have is not being seen, but they think they're doing enough. And it was okay. when I went to, because I did participant observation studies, so I had to attend um, a lot of these churches over some time. Sure. It's when I went there that I saw what the problem could be. Okay. You know, and how maybe that can be, um, can, can be worked on to, to, <laughs> to help make them more effective if, if anyone will listen. <laughs> Oh, uh, they all listen. Mm -hmm. And that problem is not only exclusive to the African churches. Because okay. like I said, the new churches in, um, in Glasgow are almost all very homogeneous. So okay. even the, the white Scottish churches are not also having any success of attracting other cultures into their midst. The Asian churches are also almost exclusively Asian. So all the different categories or groups of churches are they, they have this problem of cross cultural integration. Yeah, and that was for me that's yeah, one of the most significant um, findings of my research, and I think okay. it has key implications for how mission is done, you know, in the future. Sure. Yeah. Sure. In Scotland. Let's talk about your research journey. Um, okay. what, what did you find surprising? What did you find helpful? I have in mind here young mm -hmm. African researchers uh, just, just beginning their research uh, and mm -hmm. to hear about your journey would be an encouragement to somebody. So what, what, what was your journey like? Personally, it was, it was a bit difficult for me. And I'm saying personally because of well, my yeah. circumstances and my situation. It's different. But well, if I did it, then it's, it's doable. Sure. So I, first of all, personally, on a personal level, I started with a baby. When I started, my, my baby was, uh, it was just a month old. <laughs> so he's as old as my, my PhD oh, now. Okay. Yeah. So on a, yeah, on a personal level, you know, my personal circumstances were challenging. And then when I went into um, doing the, the research, because um, my it was a bit of an off-campus research because I was studying in, in Glasgow and commuting, commuting to the University of Aberdeen for supervision and for other study resources. So it was difficult for me to like, actually find myself immersed in a, in a research community. Sure. Yes, so I always, it was a bit lonely <laughs> for, for me here, yeah, my own journey, because I didn't have any... Body. You know, I wasn't in, yeah. on a university campus all the time and you know, speaking to other researchers. So that was also um, a bit of a challenge. Yes, but everybody's research journey is, is, is their own story. <laughs> but in spite of the challenges, yeah, here I am today. Sure. So it's, you made it. it's doable. It just takes persistence and a passion for, for your subject. Because in spite of everything, I really, really wanted to know what was going on. Yeah. So that passion and that interest is what yeah, kept me pushing for, for, for the answers. What keeps you going? Yeah. Right? What's, what yeah. has been the reception of your, of your research in, in, in your church, in Scotland, um, in the wider academic world? Okay, so generally, especially in, in Scotland, it has been very well received. Okay. And that has been very, very encouraging, yes, for me. So since um, I, I finished and started to, the first um, public engagement activity I did was um, a conference which I organized um, in conjunction with Missy Africanus in June yeah. mm -hmm. to broadcast or to share the, some of the main findings from my research. And as you, you can testify, it was, you know, very, fairly well, at, uh, well attended and it generated a lot of discussion and a lot of, you know, discourse, even there. And that didn't finish, surprisingly, from the conference, because even after the conference, I've received a lot of requests, you know, from people who wanted, to, wanting to know more, even people who were in there and had heard from other people, you know, what had been, had been found and have, you know, had interest from church denominations, from academics, from individuals, from ministers, and it's been very encouraging. I've had a lot of speaking engagements as well in seminaries and in universities and 
okay. even other Christian organizations. So it's been received very well and it's generated a lot of interest and a lot of discussion, especially on the issue of the categorization of churches. Okay. Because everybody, yes, is also thinking, you know, there can be ways that all these churches can, can work together. Oh, really? What are the best ways, yes, that, you know, they're all looking for a way to partner in, in, in essence with each, with each other. Yes, so it's been very well received. In my own um, specific denomination, which is um, the Church of Pentecost, locally, in my local assembly, I've had a lot of opportunity as well to, to share my findings, to share my knowledge, um, even in evangelism and mission. But nationally, I've not um, gone that far. But locally, okay. yes, it's also been received very well. And I'm helping my own church to yeah, break out of certain yeah, issues and things so we can be more effective missionaries. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> how about the how about the wider African community? Well, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a general <laughs> a general issue, but actually my research has generated a lot of interest among the traditional and established Scottish churches. And even Scottish new churches, so it's and and, and that's yeah, why I asked you the question. Mm -hmm, I asked mm -hmm. you the question to highlight <laughs> this very fact. Yes. So although you know, the African church is doing very well in Scotland and even in Britain, they are not um, showing the same level of interest. You know that I would have hoped that they would have shown knowing that, you know, this is um, um, how things are going, sure. you know, even all over Britain now, yes. But I haven't really had a lot of interest from that um, area. I'm still pushing and um, hopefully, yeah, hopefully um, in, the, in the near future, we'll, we'll have begin to bring them, yeah, break through and bring them on board the, you know, academic and sure. you know general discussion yeah okay anything else you'd like to say about your research before we move on to other things the challenge for me after i found out everything remains the issue of the, the separation of the churches yes okay. i think um the church community or the christian community in in glasgow or in Scotland, first of all, the landscape has changed. That's the first point to make. Things don't look as they did 20 years ago. Yes, so there's a need for all groups involved to, you know, be open, welcome each other, and find ways to partner because there are things that they can all learn from, from each other. And I believe they can have more missionary success jointly than how they are operating um, separately or, you know, individually now. Yeah. yeah so that's, that's what I hope my, my research can, can address. Mm -hmm. that, that I think needs all of us to be repeating the same thing over and over and over again mm -hmm. up until we, we, we get mm -hmm. through. Uh, there are so many dynamics at play in, in, in that conversation. Um, mm -hmm. Just the simple fact that... Um, you, you have immigrants um, who are not necessarily yeah. coming to Britain as missionaries, mm -hmm. um, trying mm -hmm. to evangelize Britain. That on its own is, is, is an issue. Um, yes. And, and then yeah. in addition to that, I think a, a great deal of what goes on in our attempts at, at missionary work among, among Europeans is exactly mm -hmm. what the Europeans did in Africa. Right, that is to attach mission okay. to, to a superior culture, Christianity, and, and, mm. and to, to a culture that thinks it's it knows best because it is Christian, right? Yes, and and the same yeah. thing that now the Africans are the ones who feel like they they know best because they they, they their culture is Christian, 
and and mm-hmm. so to convert mm-hmm. Europeans, mm-hmm. you're you're not just converting them to Christianity; you're converting them to your own culture, which is what Europe did in Africa. Your culture, yeah. And yeah. and I think that's gonna be yeah. difficult. Yeah. But yeah, mm-hmm. these are conversations mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. we really need to have over and over again. We have, yeah. Up up until somebody mm-hmm. can listen. Uh, the, yes. the, the challenges yeah. in Scotland yeah. are the same in England, right? Churches don't in England, get together. Well. Thank God for your research. Uh, I think it's an important piece of work that uh, should inform the church. Mm. I always say that Af- Af- African Christianity is, is growing. Africa is, uh, is joining is. a very mm-hmm. big revival at the moment. And so mm-hmm. the African church needs its, its, its leaders um yeah uh, even even the educated ones yeah because i believe in spite of um all the success you know <laughs> volume is good but quality is even more more important so yeah. although we are in quote having missionary success you know we are establishing churches all, all over the the world i'm also concerned about the the quality sure. of sure. christianity sure. that we are producing sure because at the end of the day, that might inform the future mm-hmm. of, of Christianity in, in general. So what we do now and how we carry on now is very important to what will happen in, say, 50 years' time. So volume is good, but I think we need to focus especially on the quality and effectiveness of, of African mission abroad. Can, can you mention African theologians who are informing you at the moment? Who 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 are you reading? Who who is shaping your thoughts <laughs> or, about theology and Christianity? Uh, that's <laughs> writing from an African perspective. Well, the the first person would be you, yes, Doctor Harvey Kriani, because uh, like I said in the beginning, I approached this um, research or this field on on a blank canvas. Sure. I hadn't studied uh, theology in the past. I knew nothing even about african theology yes okay. but it was my contact with you um at the early stages of my research sure um your interest in the subject sure. and even reading the, the the books and the, the the resources that you have written actually piqued my interest okay. in african theology in african christianity and that also even actually played into what i found because at the end of the day i began to to see the, the the impact or some of the impact that the African church, you know, it's already making in, in Britain and in other parts of, of the Western world. Yeah. So your work really inspired me and it's opened the uh, um, new horizons and, you know, <laughs> gave me more information and an interest in African theology and the study of African Christianity and especially how, you know, it can be more effective in this mission yes all right and then i've also read um again with your 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 interest and your your coaching uh, i was introduced to the works of uh, Messi Ojuyoi, all right who is a, a veteran african woman sure. yeah, theologian and Ghanaian also for that matter sure, sure. so i have yeah been reading her her work and i've been actually very surprised that there are such resources you know, even existing, because in my entire research, like nobody really even pointed out to to, to the fact that, okay. you know, there were African theologians out there that I could read about. When I had reading lists, there was really nothing on, on African Christianity or even African theology um, in it. Which, yeah. which I think is a yeah, very so important was, point you're making, in mm-hmm. that actually we have, we have African students of theology go even mm-hmm. up to phd and not yes. read any africans at all yeah my book lists were all you know by foreign writers writing even about africa and i thought that was you know also a bit not strange but yeah i was thinking yes africans should also begin to write their their own stories because then they, they'll tell it better yes there is that africans need to write but also there is mm-hmm. need for our students to be intentional about finding African resources. Yeah. African resources, I, yes. Uh, I, I was having a chat with somebody um, in, mm. in Africa recently. 
I was saying, you know, went as far as a master of divinity in a big mm-hmm. theological seminary in the continent, uh, but was always encouraged to cite Europeans and Americans that their papers would be stronger, would sound stronger if they cite Europeans mm-hmm. and Americans and not, and not fellow mm-hmm. Africans. African and, and I think that's not right. Mm-hmm. If, mm-hmm. If, if, if we are studying African Christianity, there are a lot of African resources. They may be resources. hard to find, but if you look, you'll yeah. find them. You'll find them, yes. And, and so you were able to find Mercy Amao Dioye. Yes. And, I mean, she's yes. an important voice in these conversations. Mm-hmm. She, yes. is, uh, she is a leading African theologian that yes. needs to be celebrated in her own right, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But yes, yes, again, we have... It was, it was really surprising mm-hmm. oh. yeah, to see that I had, you know, uh, what they say, forefathers, like people who had gone before. <laughs> yeah, and done a lot of significant work. Yeah. And any words to upcoming African Christian researchers, uh, just general younger generation African Christians in terms of uh, mm-hmm. theological education, uh, mission, or anything else? Do you have anything in mind? comes out of your research yes 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 so i would yeah really like to encourage a lot of you know study into the yeah these new developments because it's it's good that we've done some groundwork and we are proclaiming what we have found but it shouldn't end there yeah so the story will continue if other people take it up and build on what we have found so I'd like to encourage, yeah, especially young Africans to, to pursue theological education. You know, I know everybody, well, most African young people would go to church, but that's not where it stops. So theological education can be pursued professionally also sure. as, as a career. And that is very important, especially now for, for the future of, of our faith, the future of African Christianity, and even for, for um, the, the findings and the kind of story that is um, um, coming up now about how African Christianity is, is being successful and growing. All that will not mean anything if we do not pursue it and make sure it goes you know, further in the future. So I'd like to encourage yeah, young people, young women, young men, you know, you can pursue the theology as a profession and as a career, like I've done, yes. So I'd like to encourage them to, to look into that as well as they make you know, plans for, for their future. We need many female African theologians in the conversation. Mm. Uh, it can't be just um, a male conversation that doesn't do justice to what God is doing in the continent. He's doing, yes. We, we know for mm-hmm. sure that there are more female Christians on the continent than men. Uh, and yes. we can't, we can't yeah. have men theologize for women at all times. We need mm-hmm. women to engage <laughs> in this conversation. So you set a very good example. So responding to God's call to their lives, right? Yes, yes, yes. So responding to the call is not just, you know, doing it in church or locally. But yes, it is very important that we, we sure. pursue theological education, yeah, on a professional level as well. And okay. the publications coming out of your research? Okay, so I'm currently trying to um, reformat my, my thesis into a, a monograph because I've had a lot of yeah, requests. Okay. As I said, the research has really generated a lot of interest and sure. people ask, so where can I find your book or where can I find this? So I'm beginning to see the, the necessity of actually putting it together into a, a volume that people can actually have because there's actually a lot more in my research that I haven't even been able to share. Because oh. I studied, yes, the different categories of churches individually. So there's still a lot that I haven't been able to share in my, in my um, the engagements I've had so far. So I'm planning to, to um, yeah, compile my findings into, into a monograph. Okay. And yeah, hopefully make it available to. And, yeah. and when it is out, we'll publicize it again. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sheila. Really appreciate this. Thank you. This. Thank you for, for, for having me. Yes.